My name is Dawn, and I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon. And I am old because I, uh, the last couple of times I've spoken, uh, I was in the ladies' room um, in another hotel. I always get on my knees before I speak. And so I was talking two weeks ago, and I went in the bathroom and got on my knees, and I said my prayers. Well, I didn't notice when I got down that there was nothing to hold on to to get up. (laughs) <laughs> and there was a moment whether I thought that they're going to have to hear me from the bathroom because <laughs> I couldn't get on my knees. So today I knelt down before the counter so I could pull myself back up. Yeah, I'm really grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be anywhere. I, I never thought the time would come when my husband and I would be old timers because when we came in the program, we were the youngest couple there. You know, we were really, I mean, we were amazed. My husband kept saying, those people have had all the fun and now they, now they want to get sober you know <laughs> I'm young and beautiful you know this is my husband talking now you know <laughs> but you know life does pass on and now every place we go usually we're the senior citizens of the group and I'm just grateful I'm grateful that I did stay here I don't know where else I could have gone I really don't I don't know um I'm so grateful, too, for Pam who picked me up yesterday, and I was so glad to see Charlie, and I was glad to just be welcomed by you. It's just a privilege for me to always share the good news of recovery. I love Al-Anon. I love this program with a passion. I love the miracles I've seen in my life and in the lives of other people. In particular, I love what it's done to my family life. I, I uh, like your sponsor, I, I don't believe that uh, this program is working if it's not working in my home, you know. And that's just been so important to me. I love what has happened in my family. I had an experience, so just recently, my uh, stepmother, who... Um, Married my father some 41 years ago, some 42 years ago. And uh, I have tried very hard to be a dutiful daughter to her because I wasn't that great a daughter to my mother. My mother died of cancer and I was still crazy, you know. And so I tried to really do the things for this woman that I, that I didn't have the privilege or the opportunity of doing for my mother and my my stepmother is a very abusive woman at times I mean she just uh, that's just who she is if you want to have your ego cut down to nothing go see my stepmother you know (laughs) I mean you can go there and 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 I used to be grossly obese and I went there after losing 100 pounds and she'd say oh you're still kind of fat there aren't you you know (laughs) that dress certainly hides a multitude of sins you know but that's just who she is I mean she believes she grew up with people never giving her compliments so she doesn't think she should give compliments I mean she tells the children things like you may be very smart but you're not really that great you know they just laugh because it's grandma so we went there about um Lisa and I decided that grandma's living conditions were not what they should be and so Lisa, my eldest daughter, and I went there to clean up her house. And uh, I've reached the point where I don't like housework. You know what I mean? Let's be serious about that. So we hired a company to come in and really do the work, and we would just be there to supervise them. And so this man came in, and he looked at her house, and he said, Lady, this is going to cost you lots of money. And we said, It's okay. Just clean up Grandma's house. We want her to be living comfortably. And so this man started the work, and my mother, my stepmother came out and said, listen, she said, you are not my daughter. Do you understand that? And I said, well, yes. And she said, and this is my house, and I'm the woman of this house, and I do not want you in here cleaning my house. I like it just like it is, and I am sorry. I I was so hurt. I was really hurt. Usually I don't let her stuff get to me, but it just hurt me. And Lisa was just crying because she... Lisa was wanted to buy her new refrigerator. Grandma's not poor, but I mean, we just wanted to do all the nice things to make her comfortable in these years. So, Grandma kicked us out. <laughs> so Lisa and I went to the hotel, and after we cried a little while, we pulled on our programs, you know, and we decided, well, we'll stay here a couple of days and just have a mother-daughter day. And we just had such a much. We were in Atlantic City. We had so much fun. We just enjoyed one another, and we had a great time. So anyway, I got home, and uh, last week I uh, 
one of the church members called me, and I turned her over to the church members. I said, look, I have given at the office for 42 years. I have accepted every kind of abuse and not let it touch me because I'm in this 12-step program. And I just take what she says and just leave. You know, it's a, But from now on, she's a great member of the church. You all take care of her. Don't even try to call me. So I got this call to say that Grandma is in the hospital having a pacemaker put in. And so I said, well, what shall I do? I work my program, you know. So I got on my knees. I'm trying to be a nice person. You know, that's not always easy. I'm trying to be a nice person. So I said, what shall I do? So I called Grandma in the hospital. And I said, I'm so sorry. I hear you having a pacemaker. And she said, are you on your way? And I said, well, by the way, I'm on my way to Augusta, Georgia. <laughs> And I said, Flowers, I call the church people, and they will all be there by your side. She said, but aren't you coming? And I just laughed kindly and said, I love you. I love you. And I'm praying for you. And the children are praying for you. We're lifting you up this morning, and we did that, you know. And as Peter said, my God, shall have a pacemaker and live 15 more years. <laughs> And, and she came through it, and she's talked great. She sounds so strong. She's much stronger than I am. Never had a day of illness in her life, and Grandma's coming through this like a sailor. You know, I said, oh, great. That's wonderful. But, you know, I didn't change my plans. You know, I made a commitment to come and talk here. And that commitment was far more important than for me to go and be abused. You know? <laughs> You know, I mean, you, you got abuse over here, and you got a meeting over here. You know, which do you want to choose today? I choose recovery. Now, um, I, uh, I, I used to like to start my story uh, when I met the alcoholic, and it made me look so good, you know. You know. I like that part, you know. You know, when you talk about being kind of fearful of al you know. I used to wear that kind of shield of self-righteousness around me, you know. That everything was really beautiful in my life. Perfect. Perfect. Until I met this alcoholic. And it was downhill all the way. Well, the truth of the matter is, um, I was born in a parsonage, you know. Loved, loved, loved being born in a parsonage. Loved everything about that experience. I was born in a little city called Flint, Michigan. And by the time I was one, my father moved us to uh, Detroit, Michigan. And, and we're Methodists, and so you move periodically in, in Methodist church. When the bishop says move, you move. And we got this church that was about 300 members, and I was the baby of the church. And my uh, mother and father were busy doing God's work, and they really did do God's work. They were wonderful human beings. They set a fine example in front of me as to what it is to live a life of service. And I resented every minute of it because that meant there was no time for me. And I needed time. I was born with this empty hole in me, this chasm that couldn't seem to be filled. And I was always trying to find some way to either get attention or, or have this filled up because I was always hungry for something, you know. And there never was enough of it in that parsonage. By the time I was uh, five or six, my grandfather died. And my grandfather had been my caretaker for all my beginning years. And he had sexually abused me all that time. And I was a little kid that used to come down the church aisle every Sunday and ask God to clean me up. And little children are not dirty. It made a terrible impression on my life. I felt like I was a grown woman when I was six, you know. Had all the emotions of a grown woman, you know. And yet I, I felt so dirty, so dirty. My father used to say, uh, keep her back. Don't let her join church again, you know, because I would come every Sunday. And he'd say, we don't need like a shill in the, in the, in the circus. We don't need that. Just, just hold her back. But if they didn't let me join church, I would come for prayers. And I would just weep, just weep. I was just a little kid. But I felt so different. I was always on the outside, you know. And then I, I uh, in, this, in this house that I lived in, by the time I was... By the time I was 10 or 11, my father had been elected a bishop in the Methodist Church, and we moved from this nice parsonage to this 
Episcopal residence. And so it was a big house and we had help and life was different than it used to be when we were in this parsonage. You know, um, in this home, my mother and father uh, had eight children. Um, they lost three of them before I was born. Uh, but they were Methodist and there were certain things you couldn't do, like they couldn't dance. They couldn't play cards, you know, and so their, their, their recreation was limited. <laughs> so they had eight babies. Every time my father would build a church, my mom would have a baby, you know. So by the time they came to Detroit, my father stopped building and bought a church. And um, uh, he had about 8,000 members at, oh, I guess about 6,000. I kind of, you know, my uh, friend in, in uh, Georgia told me that I'm a six-pack short of being an alcoholic. So she says, I exaggerate, there were 6,000 members when I was growing up. A little different. Um, but it was, it was a great place to grow up. I had, these, I had these four brothers and sisters who were left. I had my oldest sister who was my role model. She was really something. She was just beautiful. She, my mother dressed her like a doll. You could dress her like a doll because she was thin. And I always thought anybody who was thin was beautiful. It didn't matter, you know, what you looked like. Just she was thin. And my mother used to just dress her and she looked so beautiful. And she was just a little strange, but then we didn't have a name for it. My sister was what's called a schizophrenic. And she did weird things. You know, she had voices, you know, and, and we never knew whether I was talking to her or whether somebody out there in space was talking to her. But she was gorgeous and she was brilliant. She excelled in school. She did all kind of wonderful things. And I used to watch her how she treated men. I remember the day before she married, she took all the luggage that she was going to take on her honeymoon and threw it on this guy's head. And I said, isn't that romantic? <laughs> You know, isn't that something? That's how you treat men, you know? And and then I had this other sister who didn't do much of anything. She just took care of us. She was, we called her the Gestapo with bloomers because she was so mean, you know. And and this was, uh, this was my middle sister. And then I had these two wonderful brothers. I had this brother who wanted to be a minister. But you can't be a minister if you're born, in, I mean, he wanted to be an actor. But you can't be an actor if you're born into a parsonage. And so he ended up being an minister, which is close as he could get. And uh, he, he delivered these marvelous, marvelous sermons, and I just thought he was so great, you know. I remember he used to say to me, Dawn, now you can go with me, but you must sit in the back seat of the car, because I don't want anybody to think you're my girlfriend, because you look so bad. And I did look bad. I was this grossly obese kid. I put walls of fat around me most of my life, so that you couldn't get too close to me, and so you couldn't hurt me. And, and I just, my, my drug of choice was food. And I used it in, in ways to stop the pain in me. You know, like the alcoholic uses alcohol. Nobody used alcohol in my home. My whole family were compulsive eaters. I mean, we ate when you got up. We ate until you went to bed. I mean, we were constantly on a meal. We'd be finishing one meal, cleaning up the table to put the next meal on. I mean, we were just, that's what we did. That's, food was our drug of choice, you know. And, and you celebrate with food. I remember in church, we'd have these great services, you know, and everybody would be high on the Spirit of God, and then we'd all go down to the basement and eat. You know, and that's what you did. So I fit in greatly. You know, people would bake me extra things. I was this grossy little bitch child going over to get my food, my comfort food, and I'd have it and wouldn't share it either because it was mine. I also got great collections on Sunday morning because I was the baby and I'd go to church and I'd carry a purse, the larger the better, keep it open and stand at the door and smile at people like I was a nice, cute little girl, you know, and they would drop coins in my purse. And then all week I could buy sugar and stuff junk food and eat it all week long and buy my brothers and sisters and buy affection because actually my personality was lacking. I was self-centered. As uh, my husband says, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. You know, <laughs> that's who I was, you know, and I had this other brother who was a wonderful guy. He, he wanted to be a jazz musician, can't be a jazz musician. If you're born in a parsonage, that's just out of the question. And so he would sit at the piano and he would play these hymns. And my brothers and sisters and I would stand around that piano and we would just sing our hearts out. It was just beautiful. You'd think it was a Mormon tabernacle choir. We'd just break out in song. And my dad would leave the house and go to a meeting or something. And we'd all begin to sing blues 
and jazz, and we were having a great time. And Dad would come back, you know, and we'd go right back into those hymns again. And he'd say, what devout children I have, you know. And said, that's right, we are we are really devout children. We're all doing the best we can. We grew up in a one. it really was a wonderful, wonderful atmosphere. A lot of structure that we didn't follow, you know. I think that's. PK kids are like that. A lot of rules that we just couldn't keep, we couldn't do. We just were incapable. We were all kind of uh, odd, just kind of something wasn't put together right, you know. And so we did our own thing. I can remember people at the church saying to my mother, those kids are really bad, Mrs. Baber. And my mother would say, no, 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 mischievous maybe, mischievous. And he said, well, the janitor of the church is downstairs in the basement with the telephone booth turned to the wall. He can't get out because your kids have done that, you know. And my mother would just kind of frown and say, well, you know, they just so mischievous, you know. And they try to get... So I, I, had put, I put that man on my list as I made amends in this program, you know. The many things I did to that man who was the janitor of the church that were just, you know, like giving him decorated raw eggs for Easter, you know, and he would just reach in the basket and pull the egg out like that, you know, and it would all go over her on Sunday, and we'd just stand there and smile, you know, like, and once again, they're just mischievous, they're always thinking of something different to do, you know, but Mama, Mama, Mama just was tired, you know, if you've got eight kids, you know, she was tired, and I know she was tired when I came along, she had worked so hard trying to get those others shaped up. And and she couldn't seem to see what it was. She couldn't figure out what to do with me. They didn't give you a manual then. She did the best she could. She was busy trying to work with her husband who wanted to achieve in the church. And so she gave all of herself to him. And she gave a lot to us. But as my mother said, you know, she didn't really like kids anyway. <laughs> you know, and if she could have done anything else, she would not have had all those children. But she didn't. You know, and she had all of us. And we were all something to handle. We really were something to handle. And um, uh, I discovered, maybe when I was about 16 or 17, maybe it was about 18, when I discovered I could sing. Now, I was this grossly obese kid. Nobody ever came to see me. Uh, I didn't go on dates because nobody in my family were allowed to date until they were 18. So here I was, 18, you never been on a date. And I'm singing my heart out. I joined this church choir, and by this time, my father's the bishop of the district, and we, we, I'm, I'm just shining. I'm singing everywhere. I'd waddle up on the, you know, platform and sing my heart. I always sang uh, with a fervency because I met this emptiness in me caused me to sing from the bottom of my heart because I was trying to feel me, you know. And, and food didn't always fill me, so I had to fill myself with something. And I knew that God could do that. I just didn't know how to reach God. I, I watched their methods, and they didn't seem to work for me. And so this choir director at the church told me I was wonderful, gave me a lot of attention. And I had this empty, I'm looking for attention. I'm looking for somebody to spend some time with me, because these parents are gone now. They're doing all kinds of stuff. These brothers and sisters have gone away to college, and I'm the last one home. And, and, and so this man told me I was wonderful. And the next thing you know, I remember coming home from a choir rehearsal, and he took advantage of me. And I remember we went to Europe that summer, and um, I knew something was wrong with me. There's nothing I could do about it. I couldn't go to my mother and say, let me tell you, I, I think something's wrong with me. Because we don't talk about that kind of stuff in my family. You know, it's just our little secrets. We don't talk about that. And I remember coming home from Europe that summer and uh, going back to school and uh, just being terrified because I knew that I was pregnant and there was nothing I could do about it. And I remember nine months later going to the... Um, Women's Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, been in labor for two days, and I told them that I didn't have a doctor. And this man was standing next to me, and he said, I don't know who she is, but I'll take care of her. And I delivered this 10-pound, 4-ounce baby boy. He was beautiful. Had all his fingers. He was just a gorgeous baby. God had taken care of me. 
in spite of myself, you know. And I found that's true in most of my life, even in difficult, painful situations. When I wanted to give up on life and when I didn't want to be there anymore, God has taken care of me and brought me through. And I'm so grateful for that. I remember them calling my mother and father from the hospital. And my parents were in total shock, just shock. You know, I mean, here's a girl who'd never been out on a date. You know, I mean, how does this happen? You know, and my, my father was at a church conference in Chicago, and he had to fly in to Detroit. And uh, he was just, he said, it doesn't, listen, he said, we're not going to talk about this. And I was so relieved because I thought I was going to get one of those long sermons, you know, that go on and on. And then when he would stop, my mother would go on with the sermon, and it would just go on for days. We used to say God called the wrong person to the ministry because my mother's sermons were much longer than my father's and much more involved. You know, so we got in the car coming home from the hospital. And they put this little baby in my arms, and my brother and my sister and my mother and my father were in the car. And we got to a stoplight. And this woman opened the door of the car, and she took the baby out of my arms, and she closed the door of the car. And we drove on. And my dad said, I am a bishop in the church. My dad said, I have lived an exemplary life before you. My dad said, you get back to school, young lady, and you make something of yourself. My dad said, I am totally embarrassed, and I don't want to hear about it. And I remember screaming and crying and waking up in the middle of the night wondering, where is he? And I go from church to church and look at little babies and see if his hair grew just like my sons had grown. You know, and, and then one day I decided, after many months of being just totally depressed, not wanting to live, I looked in the mirror and I said, you know, the only thing wrong with me is I'm fat. See, I've always tried to clean up the outside, you know. I'm going to clean up the outside, so the thing that's really wrong with me is I'm fat. And if I deal with the fat part of me, everything's going to be all right. So I discovered a diet doctor who gave me amphetamines and gave me a shot. And I would go home. This is a child who never did anything. I remember I never, I didn't pick up a thing. It was just not in my, not in my, my, my scheme of life to clean anything. By that time, we had help. I remember once Mama was going to teach me how to clean a bathroom, and I did it so poorly, she paid me double my allowance for not cleaning it. You know, it was that kind of, I mean, that's the kind of kid I was. I mean, I just, my mother would say, when are you going to learn to be of help to us? And I said, well, one day I'm going to marry a poor man, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work then, so I have to rest. And she would buy that because she was tired, you know. She was, little did she know, she was right. I was right. But anyway, <laughs> anyway. Um, where was I? <laughs> Part of age. Um, oh, I got this. Thank you. Got these shots, and 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 it took about a year. I had a, went on a diet that I was uh, I was drinking black coffee and eating fruit. And one morning I woke up, and I looked in the mirror, and this grossly. Obese. I mean, I mean, this pitiful looking child had turned into a living fox. I mean, I was looking good. I mean, I was looking good. I wasn't just looking a little bit good. I mean, I was looking really good. I mean, my brother said, you can ride in the front seat. You know what I mean? You know, and, 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 and his friends were saying, man, what happened to your sister, you know? I mean, I, was look- I knew this couldn't last long because food was looming over here waiting for me, you know. Sometimes in the middle of the night I'd hear this ice cream in the in the refrigerator saying, Dawn, come on down here, I can make you feel better. But I resisted because I had a plan and the plan was I'm gonna find Mr. Wright. I'm gonna get married and it's gonna be all right because then I'm gonna start a family and it's gonna be just wonderful, you know, so I met this wonderful guy. He uh, pastored a church in, in Pontiac, Michigan. Fine young man. Fell in love with the outside of me. Nothing had changed on the inside. I was still the same angry child I'd always been, the same depressed child I'd always been, the same self-centered child I'd always been. But this guy had fallen in love with the illusion of who I was. And I knew, since I no longer had these amphetamines, I was going to go back to food. It was just a matter of time. So I, I, he 
fell so deeply in love with me. He said, I want you to marry me. I want you to be the wife I've always wanted. You know, I'm going to be this pastor's wife. And I thought, well, I said, of course, yes, I'll marry you. You know, well, I was also going with this guy who worked for the government. And he had fallen in love with the outside of me. And he said, I love you very much. He said, will you marry me? Now, I thought for a minute about the fact that I had said that yes to this other guy. And I was wearing his ring occasionally. <laughs> you know? But nevertheless, you know, one is never enough. So I said yes. <laughs> you know? I said yes. And, and then this guy who came home from the service, who was really spacey, I mean, he was really strange. I mean, he was so strange. He didn't have a car. We, took, we, we, we went all of our courting days on the bus or the streetcar, you know, because he didn't have anything. He had his mustering out pay that he'd gotten from the service, and, and he knew how to live. You know what I mean? He took me to places I had never been. He took me to bars. You know, I'd never been allowed to go to a bar, you know. And he was so well known in the bars that he would walk in and they would call his name. You know what I mean? I said, this guy is really something. He told me one time when we were out on a date, he said, you know, Don, there's something I'm going to tell you about myself. He said, I'm an alcoholic. And I said, how romantic. <laughs> All your great thinkers are alcoholics. You know, your creative people are alcoholics. You know, he needed that, that substance. To make him the person, this wonderful, outgoing person that he was. I remember one time he came to my house and uh, he had this odor about him. Um, and my dad said, son, uh, do I smell alcohol? And he said, perhaps you do, sir. He said, I just had a rub down before coming. <laughs> you know. um, who do you think I married? You know. Who do you think? Mr. Excitement. You know, I love excitement. You know, my husband says that he can see my eyes would start sparkling when confusion was coming in the house. I love excitement, you know. And so <laughs> we eloped. We eloped to Toledo, Ohio, and uh, the town blew up the next day. And I wonder if there was some correlation between the two, you know. But sometimes I, I, I think, you know, I used to say I eloped uh, because it was romantic and all that. Let me tell you the truth. I eloped because I knew that I would never be able to walk down that aisle in a white dress. I assumed that there would be someone in that congregation who would point their finger and say, you know, she's damaged goods. She was abused by her grandfather. You know, she had a child out of wedlock. She's not what she looks like, you know. And so I took the easy way out, you know, and so I eloped. And we went to, um, I remember we came back to Detroit, and uh, I was so excited. This was my wedding night, and, and I was so grateful because that meant I didn't have to diet anymore. You know, I had him. And uh, we went to the Broadway market, and I got this bag full of pastrami sandwiches. And my husband said to himself, I don't have to be sober in front of her anymore. And he got this large bag of German 10-cent beer. And we went to this hotel room and talk about romance. All night long, I ate pastrami sandwiches and he drank beer. You know, it's a wonder we ever conceived. I mean, that was the night, you know. <laughs> now my kids say, wow, that was weird, wasn't it, Mama? <laughs> it seemed all right to me. I was eating that pastrami. It was so good. I had been so hungry. You don't know what it is to diet forever. I was so relieved, you know. Peter said he went to work one day and this slim, beautiful wife who had been standing at the door. When he came back home, I opened the door, and here I was. Chevy was back, you know, this grossly obese woman. Slowly it began to creep up on me again. Slowly I began to realize that marriage wasn't fixing the pain inside. Slowly I began to realize that living with an alcoholic was not an exciting thing, that he would come home on Friday, and I would not see him again until Monday. I didn't think that was quite what it was supposed to be. I mean, sometimes he brought the paycheck and sometimes he didn't. And into this marriage, I brought our first child, you know, beautiful little baby girl, beautiful baby girl. I remember Peter took me to the hospital and then forgot me. 
And four days later, I had to call my father and ask him for money so I could get out of the hospital. You know, had this rage inside me, this anger. Hadn't even worked through my feelings to my father yet, you know, and I felt this tremendous shame that I had to call and say, please get me out of this hospital. And somehow along the way, Peter remembered. I mean, he came out of that blackout or that drunk or whatever he was on, and he remembered and came to the hospital to get me. And I remember he began to understand that something was wrong with him. I remember one night we had this great party at our house. We had this little one-room apartment. And uh, we were having this party, and he said he would clean up. And I came out of the bedroom, out of the, the bathroom, and Peter was standing at the sink. I'd never seen this before. He was standing at the sink, and he was swallowing everything that was in the house. I mean, he was drinking everything that was left from the party and just turning it up. And he wasn't smiling. He wasn't having fun. It wasn't a great big ball like, this is really a fun day. And I stood there and looked at him, and I was terrified inside. He was doing with that alcohol the same way I treated food. He was just pushing it in and swallowing it. And I said, oh, my God, what is this I'm into? What is this relationship going to be? And I remember one day he uh, came home from one of his drunks, and he'd been gone for about a week. And I remember he hit his hand against the wall and said, I can't do it anymore. And he called this program called AA, and they came to the house, and they got Peter. And I remember standing, holding my baby, saying, but who's going to come and get me? I've been here all weekend. There's no food in the house. I want somebody to come and save me, too. And they took Peter in his dirty pants out to a meeting. And I just stayed there with this baby, just feeling so, poor Dawn, poor Dawn, who's going to take me? And I remember Peter went to those meetings, and he immediately became Mr. Mr. AA. It didn't take him long. He worked the first and the twelfth step, and he was this wonderful example of what recovery should be. He was helping young couples get their lives together while I was at home packing. You know, he was just, he was helping them pay the rent when we couldn't pay our own rent. You know, he was just being Mr. Wonderful. He says that he always had the illusion that somebody would say, you know, my sobriety is owed to this man. And he had this great hunger for somebody to say that to him. So he was doing everything he could, and he forgot about us. I used to introduce him to the children as he would come home from meetings. I'd say, now this one is, you know, this is Lisa. You know, I want you to meet our children while you're, you know. But, uh, you know, I did it sarcastically, of course. You know, but I was so angry with AA because I thought that when he got sober, we were going to be this wonderful couple. People were going to see us together and they'd say, look at that lovely couple. You know, aren't they wonderful people? Well, listen, in our first years, in his first years of program, you would not want to come to our house unless you called. <laughs> I mean, it was insane in that house. I mean, we argued in that house. And into that house, we brought two more children. And and these three kids would hide in the closet while they heard us rage at one another. You know, and I would say to him, always, you're going to those meetings. When are you going to be here for us? You know, and he would say, well, well I've got to go to a meeting. You know, I mean, he just had to go to those meetings. We'd be in the midst of a great problem that had to do with the family or whether we could eat this week or what could happen. And he'd say, excuse me, I've got to go to a meeting. You know, and he said later in life how he used the program in that way to escape the responsibilities of what the family was. But anyway, I finally decided that I was going to go to this Al-Anon. Now, I wasn't going to go because there was anything wrong with me, because actually I was on the verge of being canonized as a saint. <laughs> Nobody told me that, but I just knew it, you know. I could just see it. I mean, I sat there in that black dress, somber, somber. My husband would come home and he'd say, how are you, Dawn? And I'd say, I'm fine. <laughs> And he'd say, can't you smile? And I'd say, hardly. <laughs> what is there to smile about? You know? I was just, just Miss Personality. You know? I remember AA women used to come to our house. They'd have meetings around our table. And, and I always identified in. You know? 
and yet I wasn't allowed to be in because I identified with the emotions and the feeling and the pain you know and, and just as I would get ready to share I'd realize it was a closed I wasn't supposed to even be there I was just providing the coffee and the whatever you know and, and, and I decided that I was going to Al and I was going to Al Anon not because there was anything wrong with me I was going because all these AA women were calling up my house and that did not make me happy uh, I was so terrified that I was going to lose Peter and then I was also terrified I was going to keep him. I didn't know which one was. Uh... <laughs> but I went to this AA meeting, I mean, Al Nunn meeting. It was at the Old Han and Y in Detroit. And, and after two sessions, I understood the whole program. Quick learner, right? I understood the whole program. And so I went over to Northern Recreation Center in, in Detroit. And I started my own meeting that just happened to meet on the same night as one of my husband's meetings. That was just a little coincidence. And the woman that I started the meeting with said, this is a very good idea because we can sometimes go in separate cars and one of us can lay down in the back seat of our husband's car and cover ourselves up. And then we can see whether they go out with any of these AA women. I thought that was the most brilliant idea I ever heard in my life. She became my sponsor. <laughs> Al-Anon was young then. You know, we didn't have the wonderful literature you have now. and We didn't have old-timers sitting around the table telling their experience and strength and hope. You know, we were the old-timers when we got there. And there was a couple other ladies that used to come to the meeting, and they would come drunk. And we didn't care because we were drunk anyway. I mean, you know, we were drunk just on life itself. We were just out there in la-la land. And we'd have these wonderful meetings, you know. And I would read that book. We had a little blue book. That was the only book we had. And I would read those, and I'd underline all the places where Peter needed help and I tried to see just where was it that I was going to be able to be this channel. See, I had this idea that I was going to be this wonderful person for him and someday, somewhere, he's going to stand over in a corner and he's going to turn around and say, I owe it all to her because she put my life together, you know. And I became, a, I became a theologian of the big book. I mean, I can't even remember stuff now, but I had this big book so underlined and ready, you know. And on the way home, I'd say, well, let's talk about this experience Bill had in his story, you know, does that remind you of anything? Have you read this passage, you know? And Peter was like, please, you know, but I was, I was willing to share because I had a mission. You know, does it have a mission when you got to fix somebody? You know, I mean, I was on a roll here. You know, I had this al thing going great, you know, and we'd go to meetings and, and people would say, well, what's going on in your life? And I'd say, well, really, um... Let me tell you what Peter did today, you know, and it was like, uh, you're not quite here. You know, we're not really talking about Peter. We're talking about you, you know, and I, I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about my job. I got to get this man fixed and I don't have much time. Now, I wish you could say, some people would say that, well, how long did you do that? And they say, oh, well, maybe a couple of weeks and then you got your life together. And then you understood that the program was about you and life got better. How long did I do that? Oh, I somewhere between 14 years and 15 years, something like that, you know? I was one of the slowest learners in the program, you know? And I tell that because I don't want you or anyone in this room to give up on somebody. You know, you don't know when the spark will hit them. You don't know when God will intervene in their life and begin the process of changing them and making them into the person God intends them to be, not the person that I want them to be or you want them to be. You know, I sat in those rooms and often I would try to talk and the muscles of my face would just shake because I was so full of this self-centered fear. You know, I would talk about stuff that had absolutely nothing to do with recovery. But I kept coming back because I knew even people in those rooms that I Sponsored, praise God, we're getting well in spite of me. They were working those steps in spite of me. They were listening to what I was saying and doing the opposite. And they were on a journey of recovery. And I just marveled at what was happening. And then one day we were in upstate New York. I remember the weekend Peter had been invited to a party. By this time, Peter had 
moved up in the way. When I married him, he was working as a janitor at Burroughs Corporation. And by this time, he was uh, directing a medical health center. He had one of the first health care systems in the country. And he had grown into a very fine man, gone back to school and got several degrees. And I was saying, well, he can do this because he's got this wonderful wife behind him pushing him. You bet I was pushing him, almost pushing him out the door, you know. But I was doing what I thought I could do. And, 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 and our life was getting better financially. You know, we added things to our life. We had this big house and we had these individual cars and we had this little thing when you turn around the corner, you know, the, 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 the garage door would go up and I would sit in the car hoping that all the neighbors saw me so they could see how fluent we were, you know, just kind of out there in spacey land, you know. Uh, but we, were, we were doing pretty good then, you know. And I remember Peter was going to this party uh, and... I went to my closet to get something to wear, and I couldn't get in the green dress, and I couldn't get in the brown dress. And those were the only two I had by now. They were stretch knit, and they had stretched out to the point that I couldn't get in them. And I sat there and cried. And Peter went on to the party without me, and I put my coat on, and I told the kids, I think I'll be back. And I walked the streets of Syracuse and I prayed that God would hit me with a car, that something would happen, because I just hated who I was. And I was sitting at the meeting that Tuesday night and my sponsor said to me, Dawn, are you ever going to work the steps? And I said, I work them every day. I work them every day. I work them for Peter. And she said, are you going to ever work them for yourself? And for some reason, the light came on. Maybe my despair was so much. Maybe that was the problem. I don't know what it was. But for some reason, she said, are you going to work them for yourself? And by this time, the kids were growing up, and they were no longer my little cute people who would perform for me and, and who got all A's for me and, and sang for me and did poetry for me and excelled in drama for me. They were doing their own things. And I was getting scared because I was losing control. No longer could I say, just sit here. They were going. And I was terrified inside. I knew I hadn't laid the right foundation for those kids. I knew those kids had seen me crazy. I had not set the example. I said they watched what I did, and I was terrified. But she said, are you going to work those steps? And I realized that night, I am so powerless. I am so powerless. I just, I just don't seem to be able to do anything. And I said, but I've got to fix these kids first. And she said, you know, when you're playing, and they say if, if there's some turbulence, if there's some problem, you put the oxygen mask on yourself and then put it on your children. And I said, oh, that's a novel idea. You know, I began working on dog, you know. I began to understand that the problem with me is me. You know, that, that cuts it down. You know, that makes it very small. It's not my children or my husband or my parents or my, my, uh, my in-laws or any of those people. The problem with me is me. So that means maybe something can change. You know, and I understood that that miracles happened in the rooms because people got well in spite of themselves. People would come in like whirling dervishes, and before long, they'd be sitting there discussing the steps, discussing a whole life. And here I was still spinning like a whirling dervish, and I began to understand if they could get well, there's a possibility I can. But I can't do it until I get under new management. And that's what the third step was for me, to just surrender who I had become and understand that the God of my understanding wants me whole, wants me well, wants all the best for me, not just for those kids, not just for my husband, not for the other people in the group, that God actually loves me. And I had a hard time internalizing that, hard time internalizing that. But I kept coming back. And people began to listen to what I said, and that was another big miracle, because nobody had ever done that before. And I began to understand that I had something to say. 
I began to work those steps on a daily basis in my life. I look back on where I come from. I look back on that parsonage. I look back at my grandfather. I look back at the sexual abuse. I look back at my, my, my experience with that man who had raped me in that car. And I look back on where I came from. And you know what? I fell in love with that dog in her brokenness. Because I saw that no matter what had happened, she was a survivor. And she tried to make it. She just didn't have the tools. And I began the process of working these steps in my life. And miracles began to happen. I told somebody about me. That was a big miracle. Grew up in a parsonage. You know, certain things we don't talk about. It's just very private business. We don't talk about what goes on in here. It's real secret stuff. And, and I didn't know how to just tell somebody, let me tell you about me. You know, let me tell you about what's happened. And I was able to sit down with another human being and share me. And they didn't get up and leave. They didn't say, oh my goodness, how could you do that? I just don't understand. How could you even think like that? Because that's what I used to hear sometimes at church. People don't think that way. Well, I did. And I needed to have somebody hear me and affirm me, even in my brokenness. And I remember um, getting to that sixth step saying, God, please, you know. I am so tired of this self-pity. I'm so tired of this anger and this rage. I'm so tired of this jealousy. I'm so tired of this compulsive eating. I'm so tired of all these things. But Lord, I can't seem to fix it. I've tried, so I'm getting ready, Lord. I'm willing. You do what you want. The first miracle I saw, my husband and I, we were at this, uh, he was entertaining his staff. And it was a big, big, big gathering. And uh, he had told me a couple of weeks ago that he had hired a new secretary, but he told me she was old. And I said, that's good, you know, like old, very old, I hope. Probably was my age, you know. But anyway, that's what I was hoping, you know. Anyway, this young thing in a mini skirt. Do you hear me? She had this mini skirt, and she sashayed up to me. And she said, Mrs. Crawford, I'm your husband's new secretary. Well... I mean, I was just blowing. I blew up. I mean, it was like, oh, my God. I couldn't, you know, when jealousy hits your feet, it just kind of just keeps coming up. And it just, you know, I mean, it's just more than you can handle. It was just like this terrible outrage. I mean, and I could see my husband coming over to drag me out of this thing before I started exploding. And we got in the car, and I remember all the way home saying, you told me this, and you told me that. How dare you this, and how dare you that. And I mean, I was, Peter said, do you think this has anything to do with your self-esteem? Well, that really is me. That really hit me. What do you mean having to do with my self-esteem? My sponsor said, you know, if you want to lift your self-esteem, why don't you start doing esteemable things? Ha! Huh. What is she saying, you know? I remember uh, we were at a retreat not long after that, and I had been praying, and I had been saying, God, do me with me what you will. You know, I've been saying, I, I just can't live like this. This jealousy is more than I can handle. I mean, I, can, I just couldn't handle it anymore. And I remember we were at this retreat, and my husband was standing over in a corner talking to two attractive women. And I looked over, and all I felt in my heart was love. You know, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that on my own. You know, I didn't have the ability to change that inside of me and all that insecurity and all that stuff that was just bottled up in me. I looked over there and all I felt was love. I was sold. These steps work. Trust me. These steps work. You know, if they could change crazy dawn, they work. You know, I heard my daughter say to somebody sometime, if, if my mother could get well, anybody can. You know, and I take that as a compliment, you know. I began to let God do for me those things that I was totally incapable of doing for myself. You know, I began to walk a different way rather than the path I used to follow. I began to walk the program way. And I began to realize I had a short time here and I need to make amends to these children and to these people who I've come in contact with all those beginning years in the program. And what I had done by looking like, my kids used to call us the fig trees. You know, there's a passage in the Bible about these fig trees and they look like they're in bloom. You know, we always looked like we had something to say. No, we were empty. We just looked that way, you know. 
And I began to understand that it was necessary to live this life on a daily basis in everything you do. I remember getting ready to, to begin the process of, of healing the breach between my daughters and my, my son and myself. And I remember old Lisa came to me and Lisa said, Mama, she said, I need you. She said, I've got something to tell you about myself. And I was going to be so much better than my father had been with me. You know, it's going to be Miss Wonderful. To tell me whatever it is you have to tell me, I will be there for you, you know. And she said, Mama, I think you ought to know this about me. I am a lesbian. And I said, Not in my house. And I lost my daughter for a while. You know? She went off to California to live, and she went off to, uh, she lived in Boise, Idaho for a while. And there was this long period of time when there was no contact, and sometimes the phone would ring in the middle of the night, and I would think it was a call. You know how that. You feel sometimes as a parent, this is the call, you know. And one night we did get the call. Lisa said, Mama, I am in Boise, Idaho, and I am suffering from the disease of alcoholism. And she said, I don't have any place to go. I've lost my job, and my friend is suffering from the disease of alcoholism, and we need to come home. Can we come home? And I got on my knees, and my sponsor said, read page 449 of the big book. Read it all the way through, Dawn. Read it until you understand that acceptance is the key. If there's anything disturbs you, you need to look at yourself. And I could say to Lisa, come on home. And know, Lisa came home some 15 years ago, and she celebrated 15 years of sobriety in these rooms, she and her friend Nancy. And, and you know, I learned through al to keep my hands off of her, just to love her unconditionally, just to beam at her. Even when she got off that plane and she looked like a missionary in the worst, the, somebody the missionaries go to hell. She, she and her friend, they looked so pitiful getting off that plane. But, you know... We just closed her eyes, kind of and put our arms around her and said, welcome home. And, and she didn't have, she hadn't finished her college, and so she got this little job working at this um, uh, consulting firm as, I don't know what she was doing, maybe a receptionist or something like that. And my husband and I would say, alone, not to her, she needs to get back to college. She's so gifted and she's so brilliant. She needs, but you know what? My sponsor kept saying, mind your own business. It is not your business. And I left my hands off Lisa. I just gave her unconditional love. You know, I watched she and Nancy last year. They bought this $400,000 house, and they, she makes over $250,000. Still hadn't gone back to college yet. But she's uh, uh, an assistant vice president at some big company, you know. And, and she's a marvelous example of recovery. She's a gifted human being, and God's used all her gifts. And I said, Lisa, how did you do it? And she said, I lived the steps in my life. She said, I saw how it changed you and Daddy. And if they could change you, then I thought I'd practice them in my life, you know. What a God. What a God we have in this program. What rich blessings we have when we surrender. That middle child. I had a middle child that was the kind of child my mother used to say, I hope one day you have a child that's just like you. You know, and I got her. I got old Alma. She was real. She really has been a challenge to me. I mean, even as a little girl, I can remember her about two and a half standing up there looking at me like this and saying, it's too bad that a big lady like you has to hit a little girl like me. And she was right. She was right. There should have been another way to to help a child grow, you know, but I didn't know anything else. She was smarter than I was. It was really kind of confusing, you know, and I would just whack her on her little rear end and think that was the way you did it, you know, and Alma knew that wasn't the way you were supposed to treat a child, you know, and she just had a way of like, Mama, you know, like she belittled me in her, her way of dealing with me. It's like she was dealing with somebody who's just, just not all there, you know, like kind of patting poor mama on the head. You know, she, I remember her saying, poor mama's in there huffing and puffing, and I'm out here behave, misbehaving. She said, I think I ought to be nice because she's not as young as she used to be. I was only in my 40s then, you know what I mean? <laughs> but nevertheless, Elma was something. She was really a joy. She was a challenge and a joy. And I remember as she began to get her life together, um, she went away to college, and uh, we were very impressed with her college experience. She's always been brilliant. But she came home one day, and she said, Mom, I'm not going to go to um, school anymore. Now, this time, we had been working really hard in recovery. We were doing great, you know, really doing great. We were 
adding things to our life and things were very important. We were just on this great sale and my husband, we moved to Reston, Virginia and he was going to be active with the Carter administration working with the health care program. Well, they didn't have a health care program. And in a couple of months, we were out of work. But I knew that since we were in a program, we're doing the right thing. I'm sponsoring people, he's sponsoring people, that this is only going to last like a couple of days, you know what I mean? Because people are going to just rush and snatch them up, you know? And so these couple of days lasted two years and we lost our home and uh, we got to food stamps you know nobody in my family had ever been on food stamps you know it was a real learning experience for me a uh, very humbling experience and, and uh, it really helped me understand that things don't make you happy you know I had my best program in those years of understanding that my final reliance was on God and God alone and so Miss Alma came back from college and decided that she wasn't going to go anymore. Now, I had gone to work um, uh, because it was necessary to get some money in that house, you know. And my husband was doing a little consulting here and there, but it wasn't steady stuff. And so I went back to work and I saved everything I made so that we could get Alma's tuition together. And she came home and said, I'm not going to go to college anymore. She said, I found myself and I was waiting for this great epiphany of what had happened for Alma. What is it, Alma? What are you going to do with your life? She said, I've decided that I want to be of service. I'm going to be a waitress. Well, now, there's nothing wrong with being a waitress, but this is a kid who wouldn't even clear the table at home. You know, uh, but she had found her calling. And so we said, whatever you do, Alma, you just be good at it. Just be good at it. And uh, I remember going to the restaurant where Alma was working, and uh, I have never had such bad service in my life. You know? I mean, she was so bad, we didn't even leave a tip. I remember a man next to me said, young lady, you are the worst waitress I've ever had. Alma said, sue me. You know, she said, if you want better service, go to a better place. But that was my Alma, you know. And I remember before she got her life together, she was coming home from church one Sunday, and she was standing at a bus stop and this man came up behind her and put this knife in Alma's neck and dragged her off and raped my baby took her down in some basement and raped her and I was so grateful that I had worked through my own experiences I didn't have to just go in there and identify and say oh Alma I've been through this too I know what this is like this is such a terrible thing I could go there and just put my arms around her and just hug her and just be there and let her talk and let her share and love her unconditionally. And one day she said, Mama, I think waitresses is not what God has called me for. She said, I'm going to Boston and study for a year. And she went to Boston and studied at the Episcopal Seminary there. She came back and went to Trinity and finished her undergraduate work. And then she came back and got her master's in divinity and we watched some four years ago as Alma came down the aisle and she was ordained in the United Church of Christ and she is a most wonderful young woman. She's just a challenge to me still. She's just, I sit at her feet and learn over and over again. That's the blessed part of this program. I sit at the feet of my children and they teach me about the love of God and about forgiveness. They teach me all the wonderful things that I would have missed had I not come in these rooms, had I not married that alcoholic. I give great thanks for that today. And my youngest child, my, my son David, he had a hard time getting his life together. One thing, too, uh, Alma said that um, she had something she wanted to tell me, too. Oh, I'm getting over time. I'm going to slow this down real fast. Um, she said she wanted to tell me something about her life. And I said, Alma, what is this you want to tell me? Whatever you want to tell me, I'm ready for Because I'd been with Lisa, you know what I mean? It's like no surprise can be another surprise, you know. And she said, there's something I ought to tell you about myself. And I said, what is it, Alma? Tell me because I'm your mother and I'm here for you. She said, I'm gay too. I said, well, whatever you are, you're a child of God and I love you. You're made in his image. And I heard my sponsor saying in my back of my mind, what would the master do? And I opened up my arms, and Alma and I are really tight. I have some of the most interesting people in my life now because of those children. And it's a wonderful experience. It's a wonderful experience. You know, these are people that the world says are an abomination to God. In my world, God says, come unto me, all ye that labor, 
anybody. And that's why I love this program. You come on under me and God transforms and changes. And he's made those into the most beautiful people. And my daughter started a church in Chicago about two months, about a year ago. It was a year last week. And uh, for people who are on the outside of the edge, she started with about four people. And now she's got about 175 in just a year. And it's the most, my, we're going to be with her for Pentecost Sunday. And we're going to all celebrate, you know, as the power of the Lord comes down. We're just so, I love my family. We get together, and before you know it, it's a meeting. They bring their friends, and before you know it, they say, oh, well, let's talk about gratitude. And before you know it, we're all having a meeting. We're all around there somewhere. Because God has been so much a part of our life. And recovery has been so much a part of our life. And AA and al have been so much a part of our life that that's what we talk. You know, any kind of spirituality, as my daughter said, every sermon she preaches has the backdrop of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's a marvelous miracle. Oh, David tried to get himself together. He was doing okay. But uh, this is the same he, young man I remember... Um, Trying to kill himself when he was a little boy and we had to take him to the hospital. Children who grow up in, in homes like my home where, where dysfunction is everywhere, they don't feel good about themselves because they keep thinking it's something to do with them. It has nothing to do with them. It has to do with the sick parent. It has to do with the disease of alcoholism. It has to do with whatever it is that separates us. It has to do with the mother who is not feeling good about herself. You can't give your kids something you don't have. That's why these rooms have been so important to me. That's why I keep coming back for 39 years, because I'm not well out there. But I come in here and I learn all the tools that I need, and out there they think I'm a normal human being. You know? I remember we took David to the hospital, and, and we, we just were able to be there for him. We didn't have to go there and preach a message or do anything like that. We just put our arms around David. And we watched David come through that process. And he got out of the hospital, and he began to look a little better. And he looked like he felt a little better about himself. And, and, and I remember one day he called me, and I knew this was a call. This was that middle-of-the-night call. And the call said, he said, Mama, there's um, something wrong with me. She said, I'm in a bar. And I'm so drunk, I don't know what, I don't know what my name is. He said, but something happened. He said, I came out of that bar and this man said to me, you don't have to live like that, young man. I'll take you to a 12-step program. I never thought God would meet my son in a bar, in the restroom. What an extravagant God, you know? I mean, he took David at that point in his brokenness and got into the bar you know, you don't know where God is, you know. That's what I love about, you know, you don't know where he's going to meet somebody, you know. And my son is sober today, and last night he opened up in a Cole Porter review. I'm so grateful, and David said, Mama, there's something I ought to tell you about myself. And I said, uh, I know. It's okay. You know, I have three beautiful gay children, just beautiful gay children, you know. Just, just, I'm just, I'm just so grateful. God knew who to give those children to. He really did, you know, or she really did, whoever. About uh, 15 years ago, just before I, um, as my recovery had become rich and strong, I was with my sister, and my sister said, uh, Mama, there's, uh, she said, Dawn, there's something I need to tell you. Um, she said, remember... Uh, when I adopted this child some 40-something years ago, she said, this is your son. And I was reunited with my baby. I didn't need him anymore, you know what I mean? God had filled the hole. You know, I had this empty spot in me. God had filled it, you know. And I could open up my arms and say, oh, I'm so grateful. We have such a great relationship. I was with him last April when my granddaughter was uh, baptized in the Episcopal Church, you know. And we had such a great fellowship. And after we leave Alma in May, we're going to go from there to visit with him and his family. And I, it's just such richness God has given just because... Just because I surrendered, you know. My husband and I have a marvelous relationship today, you know. I mean, he's my best friend. He's my lover. He is the finest man I've ever met. I just love that man, you know. It's just such a wonderful thing that's happened as a result of these steps. I took my eyes off of him and stopped trying to fix him, you know. And one day I looked around and God and you had done the job, you know. I began to see... You know, I used to pray, God, please just let me see you in him. 
Let me stop looking for his faults. Let me see you and him. And I began to see that this man had been transformed, and I just love him to death. Just love him to death. Uh, I, I, I've seen all these miracles in my life. I've, I've been able to go back to that abuser. You know that person that sexually abused me? When the rage would come up in me, when I would think of what he did to a little girl. You don't do stuff like that to a little girl. And one day I was sitting in a meeting, and I realized he must have been victimized all his life. My grandfather was a slave. You know, he had been abused most of his life, and he was sick. But he didn't do that on purpose. He was sick. And I was able to look at that situation and finally reach some peace in my heart. He said, I can't help it. I love my grandfather, you know, and I forgive him. I know it's wrong what he did, and I would protect any child against that kind of behavior. But I love my grandfather today, you know. I took a lot of work with these steps. I took a lot of work with these steps, you know. And that man who, who, who abused me coming home from church, you know, I had to look at him because, you know, if that experience, you know, since we will not regret the past nor wish to close the door on it, out of that experience I have these two wonderful grandchildren, you know. Would I have missed that to avoid that experience? Not on your life. Not on your life. Those are the joys of my life, you know. We never know what bad situation in our life God is going to turn and twist and change and make it into the road that keeps us following Him on a daily basis, you know. My parents did the best they could. They didn't throw that boy away. They somehow hid him for a while and then brought him back into the family. I thank them over and over again. They're both gone now. But I praise them for their goodness to me. And I know they were trying to do the best they could. I stand here this morning because uh, I don't have any place else to go. What's the most important thing in my life? Getting to my meetings, you know. My sponsors say to me, Dawn, how many meetings do you go to a week? You know, I'm retired, you know. I go to at least five meetings a week. And then I'm here on the weekend, you know. <laughs> and, and, and the thing that's interesting, um, I'm not perfect. You know what I mean? I, you would think all this time and all this, you know, I still keep discovering these little hidden pockets in me that need work, you know. But the thing is, I'm never afraid of them now because I know God in my understanding. If I work these steps, if I look at them, if I share them with another human being, and if I become ready, God will straighten the road again. That's what he constantly does for me, you know. There was this man that reminds me of myself. He used to sit by the roadside for some 38 years. He was broken. He, uh, he uh, wanted to be well, but he would have had to get up and go into the pond. And, and when the rustled the pond, you know, he would have to get in there. And, 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 and he just sat by the roadside. Here's healing right across from him. But he sat by the roadside. And other people would come along and get in the pond, and they'd get better. And he just sat by the roadside. You know, kind of reminded me sitting in those Al-Anon meetings all those years. You know, people were coming in, and they'd get better, and I'm just sitting there watching them. You know, like in La La Land, flaking, you know. But I was doing the best I could. That was all I could do at that point in my life. I believe often in the stressful times of our life, we are where God wants us to be. Because there's a lesson we have to learn in this experience. And I had a lot of lessons to to learn. So I just sat in that roadside just like that man, you know, just with and finally a man named Jesus came by and he said to him, Do you want to be well? And this man probably had the same excuse as I had. I, I, I want to be well, but I'm not ready to give up anger and self pity and resentment. You don't understand what's been done to me. I got these things I've got to hold on to because if you take these things away from me, I won't even be here. And Jesus said to this man again, Do you want to be well? And the man said, yes. And Jesus said, then pick up your bed and walk. You know, my sponsor said, Dawn, do you want to be well? Are you tired? Are you tired of, of, of wreaking havoc wherever you go? Do you want to be well? Then pick up those steps. Pick them up and walk. There's recovery in these rooms. There's hope in these rooms. I don't care where you are on your journey, you know. I don't care if you suffer from terminal uniqueness. God wants you well, or you wouldn't be sitting here on a Saturday morning in Augusta, Georgia, listening to a babbling old woman talk about recovery, you know. Come to the fountain. 
and drink. Pick up your steps and walk. You know, pardon from sin and a peace that endure. Thine own dear presence to lead and to guide. Faith for the day and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings are mine and 10,000 beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, not wanted, all I have needed, God's hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness to me. Thank you. Thank you.